Well, hi there, and welcome once again to In Search of Christianity, brought to you by Bible Talk. And once again, on behalf of myself and Mark and Alice, who are here with me in the, our, our little studio, we want to greet you in the wonderful name of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. As we continue on in our study of Paul's letter to the church at Ephesus, this is our 10th part, our 10th week in this study. Uh, so all of the previous ones are up on the website, our website, BibleTalk.com, and will remain there, hopefully until the Lord comes back, which hopefully won't be too long, but that's another story. So, yeah, we want to greet you, and uh, I, I do want to suggest that you have your Bible handy so you can follow along, and perhaps you want to take some notes, and we encourage you to write to us at office at BibleTalk.com with any questions or comments or suggestions that you might have. We'd like to make this as interactive as it is possible to do in this kind of setting. So, Father, we just thank you, Lord God. I thank you that we can take this, have this opportunity to share your word, to be together in your word, together as this is. Lord, that we would grow in your word. You've given us your word everything in your word that we might share in your holiness, Lord God, that we might be partakers of your divine nature, as your apostle Peter said. Lord, let it be our instruction for living godly. We thank you for the example of your son, Christ Jesus. We thank you for the example that we have from the apostle Paul, who said that we should follow him even as he followed you. Lord, by the power of your spirit, we trust that we can do exactly that, that we can live in the, in the holiness that is set by your son, Christ Jesus. Our desire, our great desire, is to be pleasing to you. So, Father, we thank you in the name of your son, Jesus Christ. Amen. All right, well, uh, we finished up last week in our ninth session, and we were just starting in the third, well, we started in the third chapter, and we did the first two verses so today I'm going to pick up in Ephesians chapter 3, verse 3. Open your Bibles. Okay. That by revelation there was made known to me the mystery as I wrote before in brief. Paul's talking about revelation. He's talking about he's made known the mystery. Now, we, we talked, as a matter of fact, in the second uh, or first chapter when Paul was talking about knowing the mystery of God's will. That a mystery is not like you see on television. You know, you just get a bunch of clues for half an hour, and then you 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 deduct, you deduce from that what the correct answers are. No, this revelation is. Well, let me tell you what it says in uh, the dictionary. It says any truth that is unknowable except by divine revelation. That's the definition of a rev of a mystery. In other words, you can't figure it out. You can't lean on your own understanding. You can't use logic. You, you've got to, it has to come by revelation from God. And, you know, a great example of that is found in the Gospel of Matthew. Remember, and this is in Matthew 16, when Jesus had come in and he asked his disciples, who do the people say that I am? Let me read that to you. In verse six, 13 of chapter 16, it starts, Now when Jesus came into the district of Caesarea, Caesarea Philippi, he was asking his disciples, who do people say the Son of Man is? And they said, some say John the Baptist, others Elijah, but still others, Jeremiah or one of the prophets. He said to them, but who do you say that I am? Simon Peter answered, you are the Christ, the Son of the living God. And Jesus said to him, blessed are you, Simon Bar-Jonah because flesh and blood did not reveal this to you, but my Father who is in heaven. Like I said, it wasn't based on logic or human understanding, but divine revelation. We need divine revelation, because I'm telling you, and that's why we have the Holy Spirit, and the Holy Spirit, the power of the Holy Spirit within us is to lead us into all truth. That is divine revelation. You know, Paul's entire ministry was based on divine revelation. Revelation of Jesus that began on the road to Damascus as Paul was headed there to track down and persecute the Jews who had believed. Paul's revelation of who Jesus is, and he said, he is the son of God. 
That's in Acts 9, uh, 920. That became his mission both to the saints and to the Jews in the synagogues of Damascus and continued throughout the Roman world during his life and his ministry and beyond. I mean, we are still benefiting from the revelation that Paul got starting on the road to Damascus. So Paul had written just before, and that's what I, I mentioned, that God had made known to him the mystery of his will, Ephesians 1.9. And here he is going to expand now and expound on it. Ephesians 3, verses 4 through 6. He says, by referring to this, when you read, you can understand my insight into the mystery of Christ, which in other generations was not made known to the sons of men, as it has now been revealed to his holy apostles and prophets in the Spirit. To be specific, that the Gentiles are fellow heirs and fellow members of the body and fellow partakers of the promise in Christ Jesus through the gospel. The mystery of Christ now revealed was that the Gentiles are fellow heirs, fellow members of the body, and fellow partakers of the promise in Christ Jesus through the gospel. That's, that's, aha, I mean, that's what's been revealed. That was the mystery that was revealed. Fellow heirs, fellow members, fellow partakers. You see, because division is the natural state of fallen man. Mark that down. I mean, this is a truth. Make a note. And then examine yourself to ensure that you have not been bewitched and are suffering from that division. Because Paul wrote to the Corinthians in chapter 1, verse 10. He said, Now I exhort you, brethren, by the name of our Lord Jesus Christ, that you all agree and that there be no divisions among you, but that you be made complete in the same mind and in the same judgment. Ever since man fell, well, he kind of jumped into sin, he's been living, and his descendants have been living in division. The division started, first of all, with God, right? Think about what it says in Genesis 3. I'm going to read from verse 8 to 10. They heard, this is the, Adam and the woman, they heard the sound of the Lord God walking in the garden in the cool of the day. And the man and his wife hid themselves from the presence of the Lord God among the trees of the garden. Then the Lord God called to the man and said to him, where are you? He said, I heard the sound of you in the garden and I was afraid because I was naked. So I hid myself. I'm telling you that when you sin, it'll cause you to desire to be hidden from God, to be separated from God. Then there was division between each other, between the man and the woman. The man said, when God asked him about, you know, what are you, what, what's going to take place here? The man said, the woman who you gave to be with me, she gave me from the tree and I ate. Genesis 3.12. See, there were three people. There were three in the garden, right? God, Adam, and the woman. And Adam blamed everybody in sight but himself. First, he blames the woman. The woman, she gave me the fruit. But he blamed God because he said, God, the woman you gave me, you gave it to me, so you're at fault. The woman, he's blaming everybody. That's, what, that's the nature of fallen man is to take blame everybody but yourself, blame everybody in sight. So then the Lord sent them away, away from him, away from the garden, away from the tree of life. And they could not return. They could not fix it. They could no, They had no hope. They had no hope. But Paul knew the mystery. But God, he said, being rich in mercy, because of his great love with which he loved us, even when we were dead in our sins, our transgressions, made us alive together with Christ. By grace you have been saved. That's here in Ephesians, Ephesians 2, verses 4 to 5. We read that a couple of weeks ago. So I mean, here, here is the revelation, okay? There's no way that man could fix the situation himself, but Paul is proclaiming this grand truth. God, being rich in mercy, because of his great love, he's the one that made a way. He made us alive 
together with Christ. That's what it says. Division was born. If you are alive together with Christ, you are no longer separated from him. That's the truth. But then sadly, even in the family of God, that ungodly, even evil division continued to raise its, its ugly head in the early church, tearing at the fabric of the one body. And it's been doing this forever. If you look at Acts chapter 6, and I've done a lot of teaching on Acts chapter 6, in the first verse it starts by saying, now this is in the early church, when the church was growing and everything, it says, now at this time, while the disciples were increasing in number, a complaint arose on the part of the Hellenistic Jews against the native Hebrews because their widows were being overlooked in the daily serving of food. I mean, here you are, the church, it's going from Acts chapter 2, where, I mean, everything is wonderful. I mean, there's utter fellowship, there is unity. I mean, total unity. No need in the body of Christ. Goes to Act 4, and there's still no need, but it's there's a slight change. You can go read 2 and 4, Acts 2 and 4, and see if you can find the difference. But by the time it gets to Acts chapter 6, and it says because the church was growing, as the number of disciples were increasing, right? You know, it's, it said, well, the more they increase, the more they sin, right? Speaking of meals and food, right? Then a conflict arose between Jewish and Gentile believers. So here in Acts chapter 6, what you've got is a conflict between the Hellenistic Jews and the native Jews. But it didn't take long from there before that conflict spread between the Jewish and Gentile believers. That's what Paul wrote to the Galatians. But when Cephas, that's Peter, came to Antioch, Paul says, I opposed him to his face because he stood condemned. For prior to the coming of certain men from James, he used to eat with the Gentiles. But when they came, he began to withdraw and hold himself aloof, fearing the party of the circumcision. The rest of the Jews joined in him, him in his hypocrisy, with the result that even Barnabas was carried away by their hypocrisy. Galatians 2, 11 to 13. See, because of the pressure, the peer pressure, and th that feeling of superiority at that point of the Jews over the Gentiles, they didn't want to have an association with them. So it's going from one group of Jewish people to another group of uh, Jewish people. The native uh, believers differing with Hellenistic believers. Now, the word and the grace of God was reaching into the Gentile word, and it was causing even more division. Why? Because division is the natural state of fallen man. Now, having said that, let me tell you, we're not supposed to be in that natural state. We're supposed to be abiding and living in a supernatural state, because we are new creations in Christ Jesus. We are made new. There is no excuse for us to be living in the natural and acting in the natural. Okay, you've got to understand that, right? The Jews, these Jews who were against the other Jews, against the non-Jewish believers, but, you know, I want to jump ahead just a minute. If you, if you know anything about church history at all, you must know that over the, century, over the centuries, the Gentile church, and I use that term loosely now, right? had a program, a power grab, to effectively eradicate Judaism entirely. So it's gone from just a little division to where they wanted to wipe Judaism out entirely. And over the first few hundred years of Christianity, there was no greater enemy of the people of God than the church. Now that's a horrible statement, but it happens to be true. And we need to come to the, we, you know, it says that love rejoices with the truth. It says that in 1 Corinthians 13. We need to understand this. And it was all about power. And I have to tell you that the greatest part of that started in Rome. Because Rome was the capital of the Roman Empire. So the, the head of the church there, the bishop of the church, yeah, see, I repent of that. There's only one head of the church. 
and he is Jesus Christ. And that's the problem. When man thinks that he can be the head of a church, things start to really, really go wrong. So what happened? I mean, they made laws. The, the church, the Roman church, which was basically the only church at the time, they were making laws left and right that prohibited people from having anything to do with the Jews, to have any activity that seemed Jewish. I mean, there was a point from, I think, in 200 to, to and beyond, where if a Christian person worked, did not work on a Saturday, that was considered horrible sin, and they could be excommunicated. Why? For working on Saturday. Because then you look like you're, doing, you're being Jewish. Because Saturday was the Jewish Sabbath, a day of rest. I mean, that's how, how bad it got. And the church persecuted the Jews, okay? There was bloody conflict, bloody, bloody conflict between the groups. What groups? The churches and the Jews. The history is horrible. But you know what? If you don't believe it, you are obligated, you are obligated to go study and find out for yourself. Don't, don't just reject this because it sounds so horrible, because it is horrible. I mean, you know, we, we talk about these present days that we live in and the attacks by other religions, particularly like in, the, in these particular days, you know, people are talking all the time about the persecution of Christians by, the, by Muslim fanatical groups. Well, I have to tell you something. The persecutions that were the worst were the persecutions that were led by the established church against the people of God. And I'm not just talking about the Jews. I'm talking about anybody that was living godly. And there's such a, a we've developed such fables, such fantasy about all of this that it's incredible. It boggles the mind. Paul is talking here about the mystery of the revelation he was given. That has everything to do with the relationship between Gentiles and Christians. Are not the Christians and Gentiles supposed to be, you know what they're supposed to be? They're supposed to be non-existent. What do I mean by that? Well, the Word of God says that in Christ Jesus, there is neither Jew nor Gentile. That's been washed away. It's gone. There are no Jewish believers. Don't talk to me about Messianic churches. There are no Gentile churches because the word of God, the eternal word of God, which was given to us for our instruction, says that in Christ Jesus, there is neither male nor female, right? There's neither Jew nor Gentile. Those, those lines, those barriers have been eradicated. But the fact of the matter is, that's not the practice. I mean, what I, what I see is, is not that. I, who's done more harm to the church? Islam or the established church? Well, I'm not going to answer that question because it should be obvious. And if, you don't, if it's not obvious to you, take some time to study history. One of the things I promise you, I doubt very seriously that in this day and age, you're going to go to school, a government school anywhere, and hear this kind of thing taught about what went on. Why didn't the church stand up when Hitler, for example, purposed to try and wipe out and eradicate all Jews? How much did the church stand up? Well, there's a silence because there was a silence even then. I mean, yes, there were individuals here and there, but the simple fact of the matter is the church stood by. Are you familiar at all with the Crusades from, you know, the late 10, 1090s or 80s? For, for how many hundreds of years did the Crusades take place? So as Christianity raised armies, as the Pope raised armies to go fight in, in Israel or Jerusalem, you know, along the way, they would always stop to take care of and kill Jews. You ever hear of the Spanish Inquisition? That's one of the most horrific 
episodes, chapters in history of mankind. I mean, the evil, it was evil perpetrated by the church. And it was specifically aimed towards the Jews in the beginning, particularly the Spanish Inquisition. This, these are horrible chapters, but these are the things that we, we have to know. Why does Paul say that it's a mystery? Because it's been hidden. That mystery is hidden, okay? We are one. You and I are one. If you are indeed in Christ Jesus, you're, you're one. You can't be divided by race. You can't be divided by what you say your faith is. Your faith is either Jesus Christ or it's not. There's no other. There's no alternative. So, the real mystery today may be how can such bitterness and animosity exist among those who follow and serve the one who is love? We're going to get rid of it. We have to get rid of adjectives, I, I promise you. The only, you know, I've talked about this so much, but it's just, it's on my heart. When I first got saved, you know, I had been raised a Roman Catholic. When I first got saved, people were asking me because my I was visibly different by the afternoon of the day that I got saved than I had been in the morning that I got saved. And people, everybody was asking me, what happened to you? What happened to you? What happened to you? And that was an easy thing to answer. Jesus happened to me. But then the next question became really, really difficult because having been, and everybody knew that I was a Catholic, people would say, well, what are you now? Are you one of these charismatic Catholics? Are you a Pentecostal? Are you a and they're asking me this question. I had no idea in the world. So I went, because I, I thought it was, it was serious to me, it still is, by the way, some 43 years plus later, I needed to know what I was. And the answer is really simple. I mean, am I, am I an evangelical? Am I a mainline Christian? Am I, no, you know what? God led me to Romans chapter 8. Well, the Apostle Paul, once again, wrote, and he said that the Spirit of God bears witness with our spirit that we are the children of God. What we are is the family, and that's all that matters. It doesn't matter what you look like in the natural. It doesn't matter where you came from, where you came out of, but the fact is family is family. And how do you know your family? Well, Jesus Christ was confronted with that question when he was teaching in a house and somebody came up to him and said, your mother and brothers are outside and want to talk to you. And Jesus said, who are my mother and my brothers? And he said, those who do the will of my father, they are my mother and brothers and sisters. If you're not doing the will of God, if you're not doing the will of the father, you want to know something? I don't care where you got baptized. I don't care where you go to church on Sunday. You're not part of the family. And if you are part of the family, that's all that matters. Nobody's going to ask you when you go what denomination you were. Because there's only one name given by which men can be saved. And if you don't have the name of Jesus Christ imprinted on your heart, well, you know what? You'll go join all the others. Who don't. There's neither Jew nor Greek. The history of the church is horrible. And the history is a mystery. Because we are the people who are supposed to be filled with the love of God. It says in Romans 5.5 5, that the love of God has been poured into our hearts through the Holy Spirit. We have the fruit of the Holy Spirit if you are a child of God. And the fruit of the Spirit starts with one word, love. How can you love, say you love, and then persecute other people, persecute other believers? It's impossible. You can't. This is, this is not a fun study to do, but it's the Word of God. And it shouldn't be a mystery, the fact that the church has been so divided. You are not... God will not tolerate division in the body of Christ. He will not. Because that's sin. And you know how I know we're in trouble? Because I, re I see the church refuse to repent of their denominations. What can I say? 
you got to examine yourself. If somebody came to you right now and started talking about spiritual things and say, what are you? Stop and think, honestly, what would you say? What would you say? And if you're willing, if you're going to say anything other than a bond servant of Christ, if you're going to say anything other than a child of God, if you're going to name a denomination, you are walking in sin and you don't even know it because it's a mystery to you. But I'm promising you that God is revealing to you, even as we speak, that that's not right. We're too much into titles. We're too much into we're playing church. Jesus Christ is coming back for a bride without spot or wrinkle. And it's not the church that I see around me right now. We need to repent. We need to turn and and turn our hearts and cry out like David, create me a clean heart. We need to have such a burning desire to put aside anything in our lives that is displeasing to the Lord. You know it's pleasing to the Lord. You know it's displeasing to the Lord. If you don't, by the way, we have a great study that we did a number of years ago up on Bible Talk called it's The Seven Churches of Revelation. Because there in the, in the second and third chapter of the book of Revelation, God sent letters. Jesus wrote letters to the churches to say, here's what you're doing that pleases me. And here's what you're doing that displeases me. I want to be pleasing to God. I want to be pleasing to God. I want to fulfill the ministry that he has called me to. And one of the things that he has called me to is to cry out to the church today and say that we need to turn back to the truth, to the word of God and stop being led by the traditions of men, the traditions of the elder, elders that we have been being led by for almost 2,000 years now. We need to repent of those and fall on our faces and cry out to God. That's all I got to say, so I'm gonna cut it off right here, right now. And Father, I just praise you and thank you that what I've not been able to express, your Holy Spirit is able to minister to the hearts of everybody that hears us. So I pray that there would be a burning desire, Lord, to hear from you and to hear the truth and having heard to obey that truth. Lord, we need to believe in our hearts. We need to confess with our mouth what we need to obey and live your word. So I praise you and thank you for the power that you gave us on that day of Pentecost. Lord, create in us a clean heart, I ask in Jesus' name. Amen and amen. Amen. Well, come back next week and uh, maybe it'll be a little more chipper. <laughs> but I pray the Lord God bless you. Thank Jesus, my Savior. Lord, there is none like you. All of my days, I want to pray. Of your mighty love.